Hey everyone, Tactics here, and in today's video, I'm going to be walking you through the first eight bosses of 10.2's new raid, Amir Drasil, on normal and heroic difficulty from a tank's perspective. This is going to be all about tanking in this video, so I'm going to be letting you know things like boss positioning, show you on my VOD here on Twitch, I'm going to be talking about tank swamps, basically everything that you need to know as a tank player to be prepared to walk into this Raid. Now, I'm not going to be covering the final boss, Farak, in this video. That's going to be a much longer standalone video on its own. That'll be up in the next couple of days here. So make sure that you do subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you know when that gets posted. Otherwise, let's hop right in here to the first boss of the raid, Gnarlroot. Getting it rolling here. Basically, Tank Buster here, quite straightforward. It's just a single cast Dreadfire Barrage. It has five hits to it, and that means it does apply five stacks of this Tank Buster, but you're basically just going to wait here, let the entire cast finish, and then swap after that. Essentially a swap on one, but again, noting that you're going to have five of these stacks here, as you can see on my UI here, tracking my Code Tanks debuffs. And know that these stacks do increase your Shadow Flame damage taken. In total, it's going to be, I believe, 80%, 80% Shadow Flame damage taken. So something to keep in mind, particularly with these flowers here. Now, on normal, these flowers are going to instantly spawn when the Flaming Pestilence comes out, but on Heroic, they do need to be hit. And when they are active, they will occasionally shoot Shadow Spines at the aggro target so likely the tank and of course that is going to be shadow flame damage so if you do have some of these dreadfire barrage debuff stacks it can be quite scary so sometimes you want to try and have the tank without debuff stacks try and pick these up but in general it's just going to happen sometimes you're going to get some of these ads so uccs stuns uh fears AO, anything aoe really to help prevent the total number of casts these mobs can actually get off now in terms of spawning these ads it comes from the flaming pestilence ability and note that the flaming pestilence ability actually always spawns uh, from the boss in front left right and behind and so on heroic when you are forced to hit these with the circles as you just saw uh, you can actually somewhat group up these flower spawns here as uh, you see it spawns in 10 seconds let's fast forward a bit if you were actually actually it already spawned there it is so this always comes from the front, left, right, and back of the boss. So you can use that to your advantage to help kind of spawn these uh, flowers, inactive flowers, near other ones. So we did a poor job here, but you can see again, the boss is facing this way, back, left, right. If you rewind to the beginning of this, same deal. It's always going to work like that. So use that to your advantage if you're having trouble grouping up these ads. Other than that, you're just going to notice that we are positioned in the center of the room here, and that just makes it much, much easier for the intermission phase when the whole room kind of gets split up here, and we can kind of fast forward to that as well. It makes it much, much easier to just kind of have your entire raid spread out and go to different parts of the room because, of course, you do want to spread out. You want to burn all the roots as quickly as uh, humanly possible, and positioning in the center makes it easier for your raid to just immediately split as opposed to if everyone was uh you know positioned on one side uh, or the other so you see again we get a nice split here because of these center roots and again remember on heroic you only just soak these circles so keep that in mind but that is gnarl root fairly straightforward here from a tank's perspective got them all open let's go uh move on let's head uh agira i'll probably link these vods also down in the description if you want to watch our full pulls here on week one of the patch but here Agira. So big thing here, um, there is a cleaving swing. The, all the autos cleave here. So you're going to notice me and the other tank are going to be together basically the whole fight. And in terms of tanking, we basically tank her right where she spawns. So right where she spawns, we stack up, we stand on the wall as tanks, and that gives the entire room available for the rest of the raid. Because again, melee don't want to accidentally step on these tanks because then they might get cleaved. In terms of the actual uh, tank ability here, it's a stacking dot. On the active tank, you can see uh, here, and the swap is about five to six stacks. That's a that's around when the previous debuff is going to fall off. So see, he taunted off at around six there. Stacks up, and same deal. When my stacks fall off, I will taunt back, and that's roughly five to six stacks, depending on spell cues. Sometimes it's going to be more, sometimes it's going to be less. So keep that uh, in mind there. Other than that, fairly straightforward for tanks. You see spear positioning. It's just going to be around the boss here for easy cleave. Um, the one thing I will want to talk about, I guess, is the actual uh, the tank soak phase. So we'll talk about that. This is the intermission. You can leave and, and at this point because the cleaving has stopped. The boss just channels. You can help soak. Just make sure you get back to this spot uh, right away. 
Next phase, I believe this is going to be... What did we do here? What did we do here? Is this the charge phase? Okay, so this is the charge phase. So how this charge works is it always baits to the furthest target and then back to the next furthest target again. So there's a couple ways to actually deal with this. One way uh, that I believe we do... So we have someone bait it. Yeah, there it is. So we have, you know, a range back here is baiting the leap. And then because the tanks are the next furthest target away, the boss is then going to leap right back to the tanks again. We just need to move out and then get back together. For these auto attacks, just again, watch that fire and, and reposition on this wall ASAP. So that kind of, you know, the boss jumps away, but immediately jumps back to the same position. You can also use uh, a second range player uh, if you want to, so your tanks don't have to move too much, just to bait uh, the second jump by moving a little bit diagonally from where the first baiter goes, that kind of thing. But generally, not too hard to deal with. The soak is going to be the uh, this weapon over here. So let's fast forward. I believe we do that next. Yeah, here we are. So yeah, so if you're if you're wondering, when you soak the middle one, that's what gives you the leap. When you soak this right one, that gives you the tank soak. So let's get to that. Coming up here in 10 seconds. Basically, just half your raid is going to be in this. Uh, because uh, I believe you get a debuff once you soak. You're going to see here it's going to pop up. Boom. And this half the, you know, you can't soak the next one, essentially, is what that means. So split your raid in half. Um, just note, the tanks have to stay together, which means both tanks are going to be considered part of the first group soak. And this debuff means that you don't count towards the second group soak. So keep that in mind when you're dividing your raid up. Both tanks are in group one. But that is that is Agira. That is the whole boss fight. The healing of over there, but that doesn't really matter for tanks too much uh, there. Boom, Dunagira. On to Volkaros, the big wormy boy. So uh, this is kind of another stationary boss in the raid. I guess not another. There's going to be another one in the raid. This is one of them, uh, stationary boss. So no need to worry about positioning. One thing though, it's pretty likely you're going to be dividing your raid into two different groups here, one on uh, either side. And usually you'll have a tank uh, in each of those groups as well. So keep that in mind. For the actual tank team of itself, you're going to have this dot that is stacking up. Uh, on the tank here in Molten Venom. This is a fire dot again, but it also increases the damage of Cataclysm Jaws here. So uh, usually what you're going to want to do is taunt off on that Cataclysm Jaws cast itself. And I think, oh, we did a little aggro rip here. So let's let's fast forward to when this actually gets done properly because I believe I ripped aggro there. Uh, that's what happens. So keep that in mind. Oh, here it is. So basically what you can see here is I'm tanking the boss, right? I have a couple stacks of this debuff. The other tank has no stacks at all. The Cataclysm Jaws stacks or uh, cast rather is going to come out in five seconds here i'm going to have like a massive damage taken increase from it so when the cast actually starts boom the cast starts you're going to see him taunt off and he takes the cataclysm jaws hit and he has no stacks of this damage jam so basically that's the taunt off here this cast will change targets mid cast that's why you swap off in the middle of the cast similar to rashok uh, from the previous tier as an example other than that you're just going to be constantly rotating around the room with your group um right you know flames you know dodging the details you're going to be soaking as well eventually here right use the soak uh positioning on the soak maybe uh, in case you uh, want to make sure you're not getting knocked into the lava get in the soak don't be straight in the front of the soak because you get knocked based on the center so you see here i was in the top left corner and i get knocked basically right back into melee range not a ton to talk about on this boss otherwise though it's really just managing making sure you're taunting mid cataclysm jaw cast so volkaros is done let's move on behind him uh you know council is an easier boss but i'm just going to keep going in the order of this wing here and this is laradar now this boss is again a step up this is a wing end boss now phase one versus phase two are going to be pretty different from a tank's perspective in terms of what you're actually dealing with here let's just start it off uh Immediately, pretty pretty close to on pull, you're going to get a few Trents that uh, spawn, and you just pick them up. Usually, it's three of them. They do apply a stacking dot here to the tank and blistering splinters. Uh, so again, kind of like normal root, you want to use CCs, things like that, to try and prevent these stacks from building up. They also have a cast to interrupt that. You got a beam, and they're fully susceptible as well, so, you know, grips, all that kind of thing. Furious Charge is the actual tank buster here. And boss positioning is pretty important, so I'll, I'll talk about this in a second. But basically what this is, is the boss will charge to the tank uh, that it was targeting to. So you notice I've already taunted here, but this charge is going to go to the other tank. So it is safe to taunt mid-charge here, and actually very important too. Because when this charge connects, it not only deals a mix of fire and physical damage to the tank, 
but it will also apply a large physical damage taken increase that decays over time. So you really don't want an auto attack to hit this tank after the fact, uh, as it is quite dangerous. So again, taunt mid mid here, just like Volcaros, you want to taunt mid cast here, but it does the opposite thing, right? In Volcaros, it swaps that attack to you on Laridar the boss will just attack you after the fact. So keep that in mind. The big thing here is to make distance between yourself and the boss, as this will deal reduced damage based on how long he's traveled. And also on heroic difficulty, this hit deals raid damage, but again, is reduced based on distance. So on normal, uh, it wasn't too much damage. We were just kind of standing still the whole time for melee uptime. But on heroic, it's very, very important you make distance to reduce the raid hit. There it is, that big raid hit on impact. And then immediately the boss is coming to me because I've already taunted. Now, something you might not have noticed this charge does is one, it knocks back there was a dk with death advance taking that hit so you don't notice it there but two it also creates additional fire puddles so that's why you're going to see positioning wise we are going to try and charge this boss constantly through already existing fire so look how i'm positioning here i'm moving back towards the fire i'm moving into the fire now even and then as soon as the actual charge cast starts i'm going to go make some distance i lied i oh this was the one i tested how much damage we were taking this is why you have to move, by the way. We were testing how much damage we took if we didn't move. It's a lot, in case you're curious, so don't do that. Instead, uh, let's fast forward to the next charge where we actually do the thing that I'm talking about. Uh, again, you can see positioning here. Charge is going to come out shortly. We are we do end up clearing all this fire, so again, I guess, I guess I'm, uh, I'm just a liar, uh, turns out. Um, but yeah, you can clear the fire, so I guess sometimes that dust disappears. Notably, after this third charge, you do want to tank relatively close to the charred brambles like friendly mob because this allows your melee to continue to hit the boss when you are standing in this safe tree here. So you see I'm right beside it. Good spot to be in. You know there's not going to be a charge. There's three charges per phase. Uh, so, you know, during this Raging Inferno, while you have to be in here, you are able to still hit the boss as a melee. He does this into a charge almost immediately out of this. So keep that in mind again going to the edge and you're going to see now i make a little bit more distance and you can see where he charged there is some paths of fire so that's why ideally again you're charging him through as much already existing fire as possible just to maximize how much uh actual space you have and again after he does that big aoe he's going to kind of go back to what he did initially spawn some trends uh rotate through charges and the same thing kind of repeats here until you push the boss uh, into p2 i believe it's 40 percent health is when that actually starts again just rinse and repeating here i believe it's around here right there it is there it is so this is the transition here into phase two in this the charge is gone it is completely deleted now you have to deal with a new tank ability uh in smoldering backdraft as you can see here frontal it is now a frontal cone attack so again just making sure you're pointing this away from your friends as i'm doing here this is a big fire hit and then it applies a dot to you i believe it's 18 seconds on normal and 30 seconds here on heroic so very long dot and you see i'm gonna have this little gray circle around myself and basically what this is, is this is a 100% healing reduction, so you cannot heal in any way, um, but, and you will also be taking fire damage throughout this duration as well. But basically, if you ever have any allies in this area, you will deal a bit of damage to them and leech health back to yourself. So basically, you're going to see, like, as you need healing, I'm just going to dip on top of the raid, stand on my friends, heal myself back up, just try not to murder any of your friends in the process, because uh, that would be, that would be not ideal for sure and on heroic especially the duration of this is, is pretty long right 30 seconds you can see here boom the other thing actually got the debuff before mine had expired so something to keep in mind you are going to have to tank a few hits of the boss with your healing reduction on on heroic's not too bad it's only going to be like three seconds so it's not a big deal it's not a massive overlap but still something to keep in mind both tanks have that debuff for a few seconds uh, initially so just be aware of that and as you see just slowly run out of space here and it's just a race to kill the boss all right laridar done taking a step back down council is a bit easier uh the only tankable mob here is Urktos. so you're basically just going to try and position him such that you're always going to be able to cleave onto one of pip or Erwin, uh, see here, initially on pull, you can kind of be in the middle and get a decent cleave on both, which is nice. Um, but otherwise, just, you know, maybe bounce back and forth between who you're taking on top of just watching their health, right? Because all three of these 
do need to die at the same time. So you need to be, you know, effectively cleaving. You see here, like, as an example, Pip is super low. So at, at some point, we need to swap and make sure we're tanking Urktos on top of Airwin instead. That kind of deal. Um, the main tank buster here is Agonizing Claw. So it's going to be coming up uh, in just a second here. So that is the amount of damage it looks like when you accidentally take two stacks here. So notably, basically, you're taunting off at one here. It's a big physical hit that has a big amp as well. So you can obviously survive a double hit there, as you saw. But it's not ideal. Uh, and so basically, it's a frontal on heroic. On normal, it's just a direct attack. So no need to worry about frontals. But as you can see here, positioning-wise, the raid is all on one half. And the two tanks are kind of pointing it uh, over here. Uh, just away from everyone else because it is a frontal of course and again you'll want to be taunting off on every individual cast of that agonizing clause and then the other thing tanks need to deal with is this barreling charge which is just targeted uh, at the active tank uh, but needs to actually be soaked by the rest of the raid at some point as it does deal party damage at the end when it hits uh you know the a wall or whatever the heck it's hitting at also note that on heroic this applies a debuff to the player's hit so you can only have half your raid soaking each charge. They have to alternate, basically. They can't soak every charge. But notably, tanks can actually soak every charge because this charge deals physical damage. Uh, and also, uh, the amp is not too high and the charge damage baseline is not too high. So as a tank player, to help mitigate that raid damage, you can actually be in every soak. But if you're worried about your health too much, don't worry. You don't need to do that. It's just something that you can do as a little bit of advantage. Now... Uh, in terms of ordering of the abilities, you can see here, there hasn't been a frontal in a long time. He's going to do his ultimate, uh, and then he's going to go back. And basically, the timing on this seems to be almost in sets of four. So basically what happens is he's going to go two times, agonizing claws back to back. So that's why you, you know, first tank takes it, taunt, second tank takes it. You're going to see that come up here soon, actually, in just a few seconds. So boom, there's the first one. I'm going to taunt. Moving away from everyone else, there's the second one, boom. There's going to be a charge next following this shortly after. And then the same thing's going to happen immediately after this charge. It's going to go agonizing claws frontal, agonizing claws frontal, and then a quick charge right away again. Uh, same deal. I think I still have, yeah, I still have it. So again, keep it on. You can live two sacks. It's not the end of the world, but, uh, you know, it does hurt, obviously. So if you can taunt, uh, do so for sure. Anyways, next charge is going to come out, and then you're going to notice there's a pretty significant break before anything actually happens. That seems to happen the entire fight. So it almost happens in like sets of four frontals and two charges, and then you get a bit of a breather to reposition the boss. So keep that in mind. Again, you want to position the boss close to something else to cleave, but you don't want to be moving the boss all around uh, with the frontal, right? So you have some decent a decent gap uh, to move the boss around between certain frontals sometimes, so keep that in mind. This is the other thing tanks need to worry about. Whenever Airwind starts this constricting um, thicket, I believe it's called, cast, you just need to make sure that you're aiming the next charge here right through Airwind uh, just so this gets interrupted. Other than that, you're just kind of aiming the charge in a place where people can actually get to to soak it. So sometimes constantly pointing it outside to the outer edge may not be the best idea. You may want to point it towards the middle a little bit more, just a little bit more, not fully towards the middle so that, you know, if range want to get in, they can, but they're not getting it shot through them, that kind of thing, just like this, right? And melee can easily step into it as well. But that is Council. Nimue. So this is our other stationary boss here. Uh, let's go. This boss doesn't melee. Instead, they're just going to spam a blast at the tank, and that does a mix of both physical and nature damage, so keep that in mind. Your taunt off here is going to be on Weaver's Burden. It's going to be coming in just a second here, and basically, it's just a 12-yard explosion around the tank, so obviously the tank needs to get out of melee. That's all it is on normal. Here it comes, boom, Weaver's Burden. You can see the circle around the tank over there, um, but, you know, there's a little spoiler on Heroic. This applies to multiple players, not just the active tank. It'll never pick the inactive tank, but it'll apply to a couple other players. Uh, it'll also explode. Uh, when it explodes, it also drops a flower of area denial on the ground. And also, it makes you take 100% increase in nature damage for 20 seconds. So, uh, much more impactful of a tank swap on heroic compared to normal. Uh, I can maybe fast forward and kind of show you what it looks like uh, from the other end here. As a paladin on the other side, there's the Weaver's Burden. I'm going to walk out a bit with it. Boom, I've got it. Taking a step back, step back, creating some space. Dropping the flower there. 
And as you can see, a flower is starting to bloom. Up here, there's going to be area denial. And all the stuff that does nature damage on this, on this fight that you're not usually concerned with, you're now taking double. Um, that does not include, luckily, passing over these lines because you are also debuffed with the flower thing uh, once you, uh, you know, drop this tank debuff. So you're free to kind of run. I kind of spam healing myself there uh, and getting back up to the front here. And you'll notice the next Weaver's Burden just went out, and there's a few things. One, um, I still have 8 seconds of my tank debuff left, so there's a couple options here. You either have to, one, wait to taunt until this 8 second expires, meaning that the tank that just got the Weaver's Burden is going to take a hit, or two, while they're out, uh, you know, dropping off their debuff, or two, uh, I can taunt here with a major cooldown up, uh, and that would, you know, help mitigate the fact that I'm taking 100% extra nature damage, which again, that tank hit uh, in this boss fight is half nature, half physical, or around there. Maybe it's like 60, 40, but a big portion of that is nature, so you're going to be taking double of that portion of the tank buzzer, so a lot of extra damage. Either works, whatever you're more comfortable with. Uh, I believe uh, here, what can we do? I bubble taunt here. Yeah, so as a paladin here, I can bubble taunt. That makes me taunt and also keeps the, the debuff... Uh, you know, it doesn't matter anymore because I'm immune to damage, that kind of thing. DK's AMS, of course, would be a good thing to taunt on, but not every spec has uh, great options for that. So something to keep in mind, depending on what your tank composition is. In terms of where we dropped the flower, you saw I ran pretty far away just to give melee some space uh, as well. A melee, you know... Uh, they're going to sometimes get debuffed as well. Rangers sometimes going to get debuffed as well. So you want to make sure, um, because there's three casts in each boss phase, that people have room if they do get a random target, and then you have room if you're the tank that needs to drop two of those puddles uh, versus the the one puddle who has a lot more space, as you can see, uh, behind me here. Other than that, there's just some small circles on the ground here. These are called surging growths. Just everyone, including the tank, is going to want to stand in those when they're active uh, in melee. Just to reduce the raid damage. See here on top, uh, we're getting six stacks of raid damage basically ticking because there's six of these up. But if you stand in them, it'll slowly make them dissipate uh, and remove that raid damage entirely. Uh, for the intermission here, which is coming up in just a second. So tanks, if you want to stand in this full bloom here, this will give you that flower debuff and allow you to make a safe path for the rest of your group over these ley lines. Over towards your ad, very straightforward ad. It's basically just going to random target frontal, uh, not a big deal. Avoid the swirlies, uh, and you're just kind of you know slamming the boss. Just make sure you never cross any of these ley lines here with the ad, because that deals pretty lethal raid damage. And again, you'll notice we are split. There's one tank on either side because there's two ads, uh, and you know half the raids here, half the raids on the other side, just for an, a nice even split. And some soaks do spawn out here, so. Keep that in mind as well. And everyone gets the green buff on this side. And there's no stuff out. So easy to get back in and stack for this big damage. That's the first six bosses. Okay, Nimue done. Lairdar done. We are almost done now. Heroic Smolderon. Second last boss that we're going to be covering in this video. And in this one, boss positioning is extremely important. Unlike the previous boss, which is totally stationary. Here, you are kind of crunched for space. Because you're going to be constantly filling in this room um, with puddles from the Lava Geyser cast. So what we're going to do on pull here is we're going to take the boss about halfway between the middle and the edge of the room here. Uh, kind of deal. And this gives us space to kind of spread out along the edges or along the, uh, you know, the middle of the room here where we plan to bait our first stack of puddles uh, with the, uh, the 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 actual uh, Lava Puddle cast. Well, it's, sorry, I said Lava Geyser. Lava Geyser, that one. Uh, notably here, you can see I actually got targeted with a circle. So this is overheated, which on Heroic, you're going to see is going to shoot out flame waves as well. Tanks can be targeted with this, as you can tell. One tank gets targeted first. The other tank is always going to be targeted on the next wave. So keep that in mind, though. Not necessarily going to be the same wave each of the boss phases. That can change. Um, the other thing, too, is you can be the target of a flame puddle spawn. So you need to be also in position to bait those as well. So you can see here, I'm going to move to the edge. Boom, we're going to shoot out things in just a second here. Notably, I am taunted the boss right now. I've taunted the boss here because the tank thing has happened. I'll talk that uh, through in a second, though. Boom, there's the things, and we're, we're dodging here. We're dodging here. Then you're going to see bait pools pops up on our screen, so we are baiting the pools here all together. There's the lava geysers. Boom, they've spawned. And then you're going to see we're going to rotate slightly. It doesn't matter if you go clockwise or counterclockwise here. Uh, we are going clockwise. And in terms of boss positioning, you see... I give a little bit of space 
between the fire and the boss so that we can bait the next set of pools along both this edge and this back edge so it gives us a bunch of extra space to actually bait instead of if i was taking like right here right next to the fire so do that to give yourself some more space and that should help you out a fair bit next let's talk brand of domination that is the actual tank swap here so boom tank soak's going to go out on me this is when it's okay to taunt by the way this is already out quote unquote uh, so you can taunt right here uh, which is always what i did previously as well and basically um, the raid is going to be need to alternating soaks on this again half the raid usually soaking uh, this one usually whoever isn't debuffed with these circles soaks the first one uh, whoever is not debuffed again with the circles uh, on the second set soaks the second one so everyone gets the debuff for the intermission for that damage amp and then basically that's kind of it on on normal notably though uh everyone's gonna get this this debuff right here that does soak that's a healing absorb and you're gonna see when it gets healed off uh, you leave a bit of a, a puddle on the ground a little swirly uh, maybe we'll see it when i when i get mine healed out there it is that's what it looks like and there's a bunch over here as well uh, which you can see uh, but in terms of positioning here you'll notice how i ran backwards to bait and that is because the flame puddle cast uh you can see here i'm out here baiting pools baiting pools but you can see where i am i'm about to detonate and i'm not in a great spot to quote unquote bait pools and so that's why you've seen me actually go backwards behind the group that I can bait pools on the other end of these flame puddles. I can fast forward to the next phase here. Dance phase, not really super important for tanks. The same for everybody here. All right, this is the next uh, next phase. So maybe you can see it better if I'm here. Basically, the other tank took the soak. Here are those swirlies from the healing absorb being uh, taken off. Uh, he's going to go out and then he's going to come back along the side. There's much more time to bait pools on the first one. That's something to note. So the first tank can kind of go wherever to bait pools because they can usually make it back in time. Worm stones are really, really good as well to make it back in time if you have any augmentation to Vilkers. It's really the second tank that has to be kind of careful with their positioning because you're not going to be able to make it back in time with how close the lava puddle spawns are compared to the actual tank buster detonation. So again, that first tank uh, is going to be fine. Here comes the second tank soak. And... You're going to see again, I'm running behind us. Boom, it goes out. AMZ. I'm running behind us because we have to bait pool soon, right? And again, I don't want to... This is does deal fall off damage as well. So the further I can get, the better. But I still want to be able to bait good puddles. So I'm over here on the puddle bait, on the puddle bait. Boom, puddle spawn. I didn't get picked. That's fine. And then I make my way back. And that's more of a thing for the second tank. Like I said, the first tank, you have much more time to come back. Uh, so keep that in mind. The second tank has much less, and so that's why I send it over there, especially as a paladin who's not super mobile. Again, if I had a Wernstone, I could probably have just Wernstone back and, and baited with the rest of the group, but, uh, you know, depends on, you know, whether you have a Wernstone available and how much actual uh, mobility your spec has. Paladin, not great. I use my mobility basically to get out of the group, essentially. Well, that's pretty much it for a tank on Smolderon. Really fun fight, by the way. Really enjoy it. Uh, and that brings us to the last boss we're going to be covering, because again, Farrakh, going to put an entirely individual video for that boss. It's going to be a full-on guide too. Um, but let's look at Tindril. This has another kind of duo of tank things to manage here. So yet again, stacking Fire Dot on the tanks. This one is about a 9 to 10 stacker. So around 9 to 10 stacks is when you're going to taunt, and that's kind of when yours falls off as well. And the other thing to worry about here is you can see the mushroom. So in about 10 seconds here, you're going to get the mushrooms. And so on normal, three of these spawn. On heroic, four of them spawn. And basically, they just spawn around the boss. Uh, and a tank has to soak these or they deal big raid damage. And you do need to alternate which tank is soaking. Because boom, you see I get a little short three second. I think it's like a 500% damage amp. So basically, you can't have one tank soak them all. You need to alternate. So just assign one tank to soak even mushrooms one tank to soak odd mushrooms here and they will spawn on the four corners of the boss so you know now the last one's going to spawn over there because the other three corners were already taken and just alternate there so your debuff falls off otherwise you see we're just kind of moving around as a group to avoid these flame beams avoid these fire puddles from the dispel uh and again on heroic there was two of these guys uh maybe more actually i can't remember exactly maybe three but you're just kind of stepping around here dodging these beams and grouping up positioning wise it's not too important to use space on your first two platforms because you have literally so much space. It's crazy. You do want to be relatively close to your ranged um, just so they can come in for these vines and then move back out um, for the actual fiery pools. Uh, and again, you want to kill these vines relatively quickly so that those mushrooms aren't on top of players 
uh, you know, when they're spawning. So make sure you're breaking out those vines. ASAP. That is the boomkin phase, though. You can move forward to the tree phase as well here. There it is. Dragon riding. Boom. Here it is, supernovaing. Where basically, uh... This, those beams are no longer here. Same deal positioning, not super, super important on this platform because it's so big. Um, but the main thing you need to worry about is the seeds cast coming up in 20 seconds here. So basically, this is only on heroic, by the way, not on normal. It's going to spawn a bunch of seeds. And these deal uh, damage when you take them and apply a vulnerability debuff as well. Uh, and so soaking a bunch of these, if you're not the active tank, can be very, very helpful um, because, you know, you're pretty durable. You can take a lot of these soaks. Also, alternating immunities, of course, on these soaks as well. Uh, that can help uh, on top of that. Just make sure you get all those seed soaks, because if you don't soak the seeds in time, they turn into the trees and do a bunch of raid damage. So that's, that's a, a big thing to deal with. Then when you finally get to the last platform, ah, here we go. Perfect timing there with this one. This is where you're going to need to be a bit more careful with your space, just because this phase is definitely the longest uh, of them. So you see here, we're going to initially move towards an edge. I think we lost threat there, actually. That's crazy. I'm uh, going to be moving a little bit towards the edge here uh, just for dispels uh, and again, giving them space. So we have actual space now. They're grouping up. Again, the massive spell thing, we missed one. And because we were a little slow on this, uh, that, that, that just meant that we got these mushrooms in the actual puddles, which again, like I said in the beginning, you want to give a little bit more space than we gave in this just because it can be tough for the tanks to actually jump into the middle of the fire to soak their mushrooms. So uh, keep that in mind for sure. Um, otherwise, though, again... Just rotating around the edge of the room here with a range tending to be on the outside for that mass to spell to get rid of their debuffs. Uh, and you're just rotating around, you know, avoiding the beams when they come out here. Uh, you know, the inactive tank running out to help with the seeds because that both of these now happen on this phase. Seeds are going to happen right after this as well. So you're doing everything basically in this phase, right? Soaking the mushrooms during these beams. You got you to gotta watch very, very careful. Uh, to make sure that you're getting all of these soaks uh, while also not getting murdered by these other things. There's a seed, so lots going on in this phase. Basically bringing it all together. Help as much as you can with this stuff uh, as a tank because, uh, you know, you're tankier. It can be uh, a lot easier for you to do it compared to someone else. But there we have it, guys. These are my tank tips for almost every boss on normal and heroic in a Mirdrasil. Hopefully it helps you guys out. And if it does, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more content like it, including mythic raid guides, like I mentioned, that heroic Barak guide coming out very, very soon, and even mythic plus walkthroughs to help you get your portals, uh, you know, your keystone hero achievement, all that good stuff. If you have any questions, feel free to drop those down in the comments below. And also be sure to check out my Twitch stream at Tactics, where I stream both my mythic raid progression and my mythic plus pushing on various tank specs. Before finishing up, I do have to give a massive thank you to my Patreon supporters. It really does mean a lot. Otherwise, thanks everyone so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video.